Hello, welcome to another edition of Kent Thinks Discovers. Today we'll be screening our film Peru, A Living Memory, and finding out how Professor Natalia Sobravia Perea from the University of Kent has been exploring the Peruvian national identity. And for our virtual screening and our live Q&A afterwards, we'll be going truly global with Professor Sobravia Perea joining us, along with Inez Ruiz, her former PhD student, who will be joining us from Peru, and Eduardo Gonzalez Cueva, who will be joining us from New York and he is of course a human rights consultant and do send us your questions over the course of uh, this Q&A uh, we'll be looking to answer as many of them as we can do and because we are uh, going global uh, today do bear with us if we encounter any technical issues well that's all for me for the time being here is our screening of Peru a living memory I believe that in the case of Peru, but everywhere as well, it is very important to know what has happened in the past so that you have a real assessment of the situation, the current things that are happening always have an origin in what's come before. LUM is a space of memory national that basically helps us to reflect on the period of violence that lived in the country in the 80s to 2000. Uh, aquí se hacen actividades también pedagógicas, culturales, eh, también se promueve el tema de la investigación académica. Entonces, es por eso que incluso en el Ministerio de Cultura se hace esta diferenciación. No estamos ni siquiera propiamente en la, no, no estamos ni siquiera en la categoría de museo, sino es por eso que se ha creado especialmente para este espacio eh, la denominación del lugar. ¿no? 
El papel que ha jugado Natalia en el LUM ha sido muy importante, pues básicamente ayudó a la constitución de esta área del Centro de Documentación e Investigación, porque vieron que era importante que no solamente existiera la parte museográfica, sino de que ésta se complementara con fuentes, archivos, documentos, que dieron una fuente primaria no solamente a los investigadores, sino quién sabe estudiantes de colegios y otros actores este, que confluyen en este espacio acerca de la importancia ¿no? del LUM. El Centro de Documentación investigación es un espacio que forma parte del lugar la memoria atendemos dos eh, problemas que hemos identificado como parte ya del ministerio de cultura en primer lugar la necesidad de poder centralizar todas las fuentes históricas que están vinculadas al estudio de lo que fue el proceso de violencia que vivió nuestro país durante la década de los 80 al 2000 esto lo hemos eh, la necesidad de poder preservar esta información importante a nivel nacional las hemos recogido, digitalizado y conservado para ponerla, y este es el segundo punto, eh, darle un acceso a todos los investigadores desde una plataforma virtual. Tenemos más de 100.000 archivos en línea, en diversos tipos de soporte. Tenemos desde canciones, música, video, audio, documentos de prensa, documentos clasificados de la CIA, historietas. En realidad una diversidad de fuentes históricas que eh, estén a la mano del investigador para poder establecer nuevos estudios en relación al proceso de violencia. Sí, en este caso es poder integrar la información de las colecciones que tenemos digitalizadas en la plataforma, porque es importante la difusión de cómo pueden utilizar los estudiantes y profesores los recursos que tenemos en línea. Como, como comprenderán, este es un espacio muy frágil, en realidad políticamente hablando, y se requiere no solamente quién sabe del apoyo económico que nos puedan brindar, sino de los aliados que podamos tener. Y, y en ese sentido, este, Natalia ha ayudado mucho a eso, ¿no? Es un aliado que tiene, al menos en el país se le respeta mucho, se conoce su trayectoria de historiadora que tiene en esta universidad. Entonces es por ello que creo que, de, que con aliados como estos, como Natalia, es que el espacio todavía continúa a pesar de todas las crisis que ha habido en el país. Son procesos largos y si es que no hay quien los esté impulsando, si es que no hay quien los esté moviendo, no pasa nada. O sea, esto no viene, no está en la agenda del poder, no está en la agenda de los gobiernos, no está en la agenda de los congresos. Eso está en la agenda de las personas a suceder y solo, solo sucede si hay cosas como esta cambiando el, con con muestras temporales, haciendo concursos, haciendo debates, con ensayos, llevando la información a, a más sitios. Eso es, o sea, creo que es... I think it's important for us to understand what happened uh, in order to construct, um, to build um, uh, a memory that uh, um, identify these, these persons, these women as victims, but also like a um, very strong woman that is still trying to find justice. de la Constitución de Cádiz del 12 y se va a dar un eh, nuevo momento de campaña pública. As Peru is going into the bicentenario, I mean 200 years of independence, and there's sort of we are gearing into a reflection, no, of what that meant, no, and where we are, no. 
And so that makes uh, the dialogue and uh, the investigations of people like Natalia on the, our history is the more relevant. Por supuesto que sí. Eh, no solamente por la primero reconocer el trabajo de Natalia que está real, que realiza en el mundo para el Perú es un orgullo muy enorme. Para los historiadores es, es un modelo, es un ejemplo la labor que Natalia Sobrevilla está, está haciendo alrededor del mundo. Eh, sus investigaciones tienen muchísima relevancia y, y sí es importante porque nos sirve de base, nos sirve de fundamento para trabajos de investigación que se hacen acá en el Perú para los historiadores de acá del Perú. I hope that I am able to continue contributing to this conversation about citizenship and about what it means to uh, for elections, for Congress, for Parliament, what it means to have access to information, to have access to libraries and collections, and that that will result in a better practice of democracy. <laughs> Siempre retroceder un poquito en nuestra historia es para poder replantearnos qué es lo que queremos de nuestro país, no solamente como ciudadanos, sino también como gobernantes o los gobernantes, y poder recordar, retroceder en el tiempo, en nuestra historia, para no volver a cometer los mismos errores en nuestro presente y en un futuro. Es necesario que nosotros como peruanos podamos conocer nuestra historia, eh, aceptarnos en nuestra diversidad cultural y poder eh, unirnos como hermanos para poder reconstruir nuestra historia, fortalecerla y seguir trabajando rumbo a un nuevo país, a un mejor país para todos y para todos, con oportunidades para todos, para cada uno de nuestros hermanos que viven en nuestro país. It's a moment uh, to reflect about, about our past, about our history, uh, what is the meaning of independence in our country, uh, in our region, because this has been a regional uh, process in all uh, South America. And it's like to stand for a moment and to question ourselves, where are we now? <laughs> There we go. And now to answer uh, some of your questions, which you can keep sending in on our YouTube and Facebook pages, I'm joined by Natalia and Inez, uh, who we saw in that film, and also Eduardo Gonzalez Cueva, a human rights consultant based in New York. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Uh, Natalia, let's start with you, obviously, this being um, uh, your research. Many people will have that uh, picture postcard tourist image of Peru with uh, the Andes and alpacas, but how how would you describe uh, Peru and, and especially its history? Peru is a very diverse nation. It's not just the Andes, but also the coast, the Amazon region. And it has a very long history, not just a millennia before the Spanish arrived with the ancient civilizations, but also a very rich history imbued by the Spanish colonization and then for 200 years, an independent nation. So very diverse, very mixed. It's very mixed, and as we, um, as there was a reference to in the film, it's a history that dates back um, really to the to the cradle of civilization. Um, but you, being a historian by trade, what what drove you to become involved in all the work that you've done with with museums like Loom, go on those talks, and go to those um, those events that we saw in in Tacna, and, and participate in all that activity? Um, what what drove you from your research to to that stage? Growing up in Peru in the 1980s uh, was a difficult thing. We were in the middle of a civil war. There was an internal conflict. I, I grew up in, in that type of world. In the 1990s, when I was a university student, I was very aware of what was happening around me. When I took up uh, historical research as my trade as a historian, I was interested in the 19th century, in the origins of the nation, of when things had started, precisely because I wanted to understand 
what was the origin of Peru as a nation and where the problems came from. As I worked as a historian, I realized that the connections between the past and the present were very important and that it was very difficult to understand the past if we didn't come from it from the present. So that was kind of one of the things that motivated me. And I'm, I'm going to bring uh, Inez in here. Inez, thank you very much for, for joining us from Peru. Um, your um, research that you studied um, under Natalia is from a very different period. Tell us a little bit about what, um, what you researched and, and specifically that work that you did with the forced sterilization campaign. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, my work um, start uh, with uh, with Natalia. Um, uh, she guided me in my research work. I, I was uh, looking for the consequences of the so-called uh, forced uh, sterilization program that take place in Peru in the 1996 to the 2000, and then um, uh, from the Fujimori government. And in the investigation, uh, the research um, looked for the, the to the testimonies of the victims of the women who were uh, sterilized in that time, and also looked for the testimonies of the people from the urban areas who were uh, who um, uh, were, were we were looking to know how was the memory. Um, uh, uh, find the, the people there and how did they remember this this terrible episode of our history we saw in um throughout that film um and especially those images from from your film that you produced um as well just what such a devastating chapter that was for um, Peruvians. Um, tell us a little bit about that that kind of period in, in history and, and why the Fujimori government um, decided to, to embark on, on that campaign and, and kind of create a picture for us of, of that environment uh, at that time. Well, this was a part of the, of the health plan planification uh, plan um, for family planification plan and it was part of the government uh, uh, planning health planning so um, the government support this uh, this program uh, they wanted to exercise women um, uh, from all the country uh, but uh, later on we find out that uh, this um, this program was not going the way that they tell us that it's supposed to go. Uh, they were esterizing women without her permission. So uh, many women die, and also maybe uh, many women have uh, uh, tremendous consequences uh, from this um, program. Um, family, uh, especially women from the Andes, and the uh, Amazonia, but my, my research um, looked on the woman from Huancabamba, which, which is uh, um, it's a city that uh, it's in the north of Peru, and, and it's a very poor uh, area. And also, the the this health program uh, focus in the poorest area of our country, so the woman can't. Um, uh, didn't know uh, really how was what's going on with this with this uh, program. They uh, insist that they, if they, for example, if they don't do the surgery, no, uh, they will be they will they uh, they um, the government will not give them the money or will not uh, taking care of her. So uh, at the end, uh, we have a lot of consequences. Uh, we still the woman is still looking for justice. Because, as I said before, um, many women die. In that images that we are looking now, uh, that woman died for um, uh, uh, in the middle of the operation, in the middle of the surgery. And um, well, a lot of women um, uh, family have to abandon her place where they were living because the family doesn't want to live with her anymore. Um, it's very complex, and, and and the terrible is that we still they are still looking for justice because the government doesn't recognize 
that this was um, this was a, a, a really a really mistake. No, this was not a mistake. Really, it was um, it was an abuse. Eduardo, I'm going to bring uh, you in now. Thank you, um, of course, as well for joining from um, New York. Um, you've got a, a background in human rights. Could you give us a little bit uh, of, a, of a background about your um, your history and your involvement in human rights? Hi, um, I did work in the Peruvian Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was created in the year 2001 just as the Fujimori regime collapsed. Um, Fujimori escaped the country in November 2000, and uh, immediately a transitional government was created, which took on a very ambitious human rights agenda, including the establishment of a truth commission to look into Fujimori's abuses, and also crimes committed by the terrorist organizations, and uh, the government, the new government, uh, took on also signing and ratifying diverse human rights treaties that have been shunned by the Fujimori regime. With Truth Commission ever since, uh, being in about uh, probably 15 to 20 countries uh, supporting Truth Commissions, which are institutions that look in a non-judicial manner into um, patterns of human rights abuse, seeking to find uh, an integral response uh, for the victims. And we, uh, and as you talked about the work that you did in Peru, and we heard from Sophia uh, in that film as well, who, who also worked on the um, commissions. Um, and there's, we've heard uh, historically similar sorts of procedures in South Africa after the end of apartheid. How, um, how fundamental are these activities in, um, in, I guess, acknowledging some of those darker chapters in a country's past? What is uh, evident, I think, by this point is that regimes that are based on racial domination and so people from the subordinated groups as fully human. Um, what happened in Peru was perfectly exemplary of that. Uh, both the government of Mr. Fujimori and other governments, and also uh, the Shining Path, a terrorist organization, saw human life as basically instrumental to, to their purposes. Uh, for the treatment of women, but treatment of prisoners, uh, the treatment of persons suspect of being members of the Shining Path uh, was just the treatment of objects. And for the Shining Path, uh, as it is evident in the museum, um, their logic was that human is an instrument um, go through in their uh, strive for um, the terrorist of them. So uh, I do think that uh, you look at the perspective and you places like uh, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, and other places, uh, you see the mentality of not going the all human right there. That is what makes abuses um, possible. The absolute conviction by those who commit them that they are not doing it against humans. Yes, it's, it's really fascinating to hear um, hear that work. Uh, and uh, just to uh, bring in some questions that we've got online, thank you very much for sending in those. You can keep sending in those uh, on YouTube and Facebook, and we'll try and get those um, answered. Natalia, um, one for you from uh, Otter Rosenberger, um, who's asked, um, you say we need to learn from the past. In what, ways, in what ways do you think Peru has learned from the past, and what are the areas where Peru and um, its democracy still have work to do. What, what would be your thoughts on that, Natalia? Well, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a huge step. As Eduardo pointed out, it was very ambitious in terms of what it wanted to do. It took an hour-long testimony from many of the victims and the victims' family members. And all that is now put together in the collection at Loom. And that's what I participated in creating the uh, in online collection that anybody can access today to do research and to understand the past. In terms of what can be done, 
something similar is needed for the women who went uh, on, and men who were forcibly sterilized, uh, sterilized without their consent, so that they also are part of this dialogue. It's very important that we continue creating opportunities for people to speak, to give their stories, to provide that, and that we have ample possibility to debate them, to give people voices and then spaces for them to debate and discuss. If we think of the current crisis with uh, what's happening with the coronavirus, Peru is being extremely hard hit uh, and has a very strong lockdown being implemented and nevertheless has very high numbers. And it will be something for historians in the future to hear those testimonies, to listen to people, to try to understand what happened. So the history is being created now and we will have to look at it in the future. Absolutely, and I want to uh, focus on the, the ongoing coronavirus situation uh, a little bit later on. Just want to say thank you, obviously, to Otika for sending in that question. Do keep your questions uh, coming in. Um, Natalia, kind of <coughs> off the back of what you were saying there and that, um, that kind of involvement of, um, of different people in that kind of process of reconciliation uh, and reparation as well, which is, uh, I know, something that you're really passionate about. Um, how, what are some of the challenges faced in, in doing that? Because we see there are so many different groups that have felt um, abused and disenfranchised um, in, in Peru's recent history. You talked about those who've been forcibly sterilized. Um, there's also the indigenous um, uh, population who, who were targeted, not just in that campaign, um, but in others as well. Um, how difficult is it to get government officials and uh, lobby, maybe international um, uh, people as well, to, to, to kind of back, the cor uh, back your corner? Well, it is all an ongoing struggle. As Sophia says in, in, the, in the video, it's not something that the government has necessarily in its agenda, but it's uh, sometimes used politically. We saw it in the presidential campaign of 2011, how Ollanta Humala weaponized the issue of uh, the forced sterilization and, and used it to, to win over uh, Keiko Fujimori in that election and took nearly five years to do something about it even though he spoke the, uh, during the campaign and he said he was going to take up the issue of the victims and he only created a register very late in his tenure nearly towards the end so it is something that uh, all citizens have to participate in and have to contribute to uh, to push governments to make sure that these things are taken away, taken care of. It's important to have international solidarity, to have other countries and people in other countries participate in this. And uh, there have been many creative campaigns of thinking about ways in which we can provide a voice to people and to amplify that voice. It's not to speak for others, but to get the people to speak for themselves. And Inez, you're obviously still uh, based out in Peru. Um, do you feel that there's been a, a shift change in recent years? Do you think the public are, are kind of acknowledging those darker chapters and, and looking up to, to their leaders to do something about it? Well, unfortunately, no. Uh, they, um, uh, they haven't looked for the... for the... Um, for all the um, victims that are still looking justice, as I said, uh, right now with the coronavirus, um, uh, we have a very high number of victims, uh, of persons, sorry, that are dying for this uh, virus. And unfortunately, also the, the victims from the sterilizations, women uh, are, are, are really going in a very bad uh, moment. And the government the, the the government right now is not uh, really looking for them for these women and also in the past in other governments as natalia said um they promise uh, to look at them and to have some of a reparation but uh still they're still uh, waiting they have uh, now it's 22 years since the since the case was uh, uh, open for the first time and then will close and so on. So it's, it's the same history and it's very important to not just uh, give them, uh, you, you know, to just, not just um, show 
what's going on in those uh, those times uh, it's important also that they have their own voice now and and these women are really uh, struggling for uh, for a very bad moment and uh, yes it's important uh, that all uh, that people in Peru know what's going on and in the world also know it's Absolutely. And on that subject of, of getting the message out internationally, we've actually um, had a short clip sent in uh, by uh, someone, Natalia, you'll know very well, Baroness Cousins, who's a crossbench peer in, in the UK's House of Lords. Um, she's also the president of the Peru Support Group, which is based in London and is part of an international network uh, raising awareness and support for human rights um, and, and issues of the Peruvian people. Um, here's what she had to say about the film. Good evening, buenas tardes. It's a real privilege to be part of this virtual launch of Natalia Sobrevilla's film on Peru. And I, I'm president of the Peru Support Group and I met Natalia some years ago when she came to brief me on her work to investigate and support the victims of the forced sterilization program, which blighted the lives of so many thousands of people, mainly women. And one of those women uh, came to the UK in 2017, Esperanza Huayama, and it was um, a great privilege to meet her too and to introduce her to other parliamentarians and to hear her story um, directly from her. And of course, as a result of that visit and Natalia's work, I think that there is still a lot of unfinished business on that issue alone. But this inspiring film paints a much broader canvas of Peru as this amazing country marks its 200th anniversary of independence. With a focus on the importance of understanding history with all its negative and shameful, violent and even unresolved elements, Natalia's film takes us forward to the kind of country Peru is now and aspires to be in the future. And where the, it's a future where there's open recognition now of the inhumanity and violence of the past, which is illustrated with such dignity in the place of memory, tolerance and social inclusion in Lima. But it's also where the knowledge of that history is seen to inspire such a glorious pride and sense of inclusiveness in what Peru really is and who makes its history. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but information is power. And it's Natalia's hope and mine that the celebration of Peru's diverse communities and cultures will help, in Natalia's words, to strengthen Peru's practice of democracy. So on behalf of the Peru Support Group, I thank and congratulate Natalia and everyone who made this film possible. And I wish all Peruvians a safe, healthy and inclusive future as they celebrate 200 years of independence. A heartfelt uh, testimonial sent in there by Baroness Cousins. Um, Eduardo, um, it's coming to you. Uh, Baroness Cousins, they're talking about um, how places like Loom um, treat these events with uh, dignity. Uh, sorry, I'm just hearing we're having some technical issues with um, Ed Eduardo's link. We'll be looking to get that back up uh, soon uh, and can talk to him hopefully uh, a little bit later on. But do keep your questions coming in on YouTube and Facebook and we'll get the panel to uh, answer them over the course of our Q&A. Um, Natalia, you obviously have worked with Baroness Cousins for quite some time um, and she's talking about uh, Loom and the work that Loom has done. Um, how important are sites like Loom in that, um, in changing and, and acknowledging um, perceptions and, and factoring into that public discourse in Peru? Well, the place of memory has been a very contested space ever since it came to be, ever since uh, Angela Merkel offered Alan Garcia money to build it. It's been a very long and convoluted process. But the possibility of it existing today is a, is a very good thing, I think. I think it provides 
a, a place, an actual physical space to commemorate. It's not the only place of memory in Peru. There's many places of memory around the country, many in, in the areas where the human rights abuses happened. But the importance of the one in, in Lima is the fact that it's in the center, in the heart of the city, in a very beautiful part of the city. And it kind of uh, invites all Peruvians to think about what happened and to take stock. It's also possible to visit it virtually. So now we can talk about physical spaces and virtual spaces and how we can think about the past from these virtual spaces. I was going to ask about that next, actually. What, what role does uh, media and, and the documents that, that we saw, uh, we got a flavor of in that film um, and that are available on the CDI, um, how crucial are those, uh, do those play in ensuring these events aren't forgotten? I think that it's uh, extremely important to have these uh, possibilities for, for people to access these documents. They're, they're free online. When the Truth Commission met, they had um, open um, possibilities for people to speak. So uh, Eduardo's team put together what were known as audiencias públicas. So uh, people gave their testimonies, and this was also seen as part of the reparation. But now these testimonies live on because they're online and anybody can see them. They were, they were done to be public and now they are there to be, to be used. I use them with my students and uh, we've run competitions within Loom to have students from Peru use them as well to have access to, to really come and see, uh, to hear those, those voices. And I think it's, it's very important, very useful uh, to actually feel what another person felt. It kind of humanizes things very much. And Inez, you work at a university in Peru. How valuable is it having these kind of resources? And is it quite, uh, quite a new thing to have this kind of access? Well, it's, it's very, very important for us, uh, for, the, for the teachers and also for the students to have access of, uh, for this information. Um, also, the, the documentary films, and uh, the research uh, from from these um, um, uh, from these subjects uh, also are um, important in my work. I, I usually well, I usually uh, show the, the my film and also um, the work that I have been doing, um, Natalia, and the, the all the information that I have the loom, and also I send them to the loom to have visits there. Because uh, it's important to say that not all the people that live in, in Lima uh, have visited the Loom, for example. No, so uh, it's important for us to still push um, this um, this um, uh, 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 the, 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 to, to push the people uh, and also students um, to be concerned for the for our history and also that we are part of the history now. No. And as you're, um, like I said, you're working at a university, we've got a question in from Claudia uh, Castillo, who's in Peru at the moment. Um, and you're working with, with young people all the time. Do you believe the younger generation in Peru still remembers some of those atrocities? And is there a danger that those memories will fade over time? Well, um, I am afraid that not all the young people know about these these uh, atrocities. Um, every time I show the film, I find like maybe two or three of my students or the people that, uh, on the conference knew about this, but unfortunately, not not many. So I think it's very very important to still show um, information about this terrible episode of our history and um and also it's a polit of, of course it's a political thing so um as natalia said every time there is a candidate that wants to um to win an election again you know uh this this type of topics come come out so um so well, we we are trying to to show more to show the people that uh, uh, th this problem still happens. No, that we are still 
this person that is still looking uh, for justice and yes. And that's a long process. We've seen in other countries um, just how long that takes and is still taking. Um, I've, I've also um, told that Eduardo's back uh, on the chat, which is great. So, um, Eduardo, this one's for you. We've got a question from uh, Jose, and he said it's frequently uh, used the example of Germany as a successful case study in dealing with, uh, dealing with the past. Um, based on these kind of successful case studies, um, what do you think are the key factors to make a successful living memory in Peru? And what are the experiences in Peru's neighboring countries? Well, what, it is, what is obvious is that historical memory is quite a fragile proposition in any country because of the political debates that exist around it. And those debates um, are not uh, necessarily um, debates on the subject is the way really on who will be affected by this memory. Because there are, of course, uh, political sectors that depend on a given narrative that will sanitize the role during the violence. And uh, memory is, of course, a critical issue in any country that has had this kind of history. It is, in, uh, of course, in Germany, uh, in South Africa, uh, in Britain, in the US, etc. We are seeing today in a country as powerful and as important as the US, how the memories and the long memories of colonial abuse and, and slavery are pretty much alive, um, not just in narratives, but in practice. Uh, and so what I think is needed is uh, um, a strong educational um, effort to make sure that the young generations uh, get accustomed to memory and get accustomed to um, constructive exercise in dialogue about what happened in their countries. Um, I think that uh, people need to uh, make sure that uh, they understand the exercise of memory and a critical analysis of their history as something that is legitimate, not something that is unpatriotic. And, uh, and we need to be in permanent vigilance against extremist, ultranationalist sectors that try to colonize memory and to tell stories that uh, delete the saddest parts of our histories. Um, I do think that uh, Latin America has a very rich experience in memory initiatives, um, precisely because of the suffering of the dictatorships of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and because of armed conflict, uh, Latin America and particularly Latin American victims have been very successful in pushing the issue of historical memory to the fore. Um, most Latin American countries have had truth commissions. Truth commissions reports are very important texts that are being used uh, for education in the region. And then many countries too have built museums such as the one that you saw in uh, the film. Uh, Chile has a very important um, uh, museum to, dedicated to the memory of these violations. Argentina, of course, has one too. Colombia has different um, efforts of output of memory in Bogota, in Medellin, in many different cities. So I do think that uh, the effort is possible. Um, it is pretty much an uphill struggle given the enormous resistances that there are. Uh, but I do think that uh, persistence is, is uh, absolutely necessary on this. And also, um, the, also guess that you have um, other external factors that make that an uphill struggle. Um, obviously, we, we've alluded to a number of times about the ongoing coronavirus situation, and we've seen that the epicenter is now shifted to um, Central and South America now. Um, Inez, you're, you're, um, as we said, you're based out there at the moment. What, what's the situation like in Peru? Well, the situation is not good. Uh, now, uh, the numbers of people that are dying uh, uh, raise, um, uh, even though the quarantena was very strict since the beginning. Uh, but, you know, um, the people here in Lima and also in Peru um, uh, needs to work and needs to go out and they don't um, they don't work uh, many of them in a formal way um, we are living in an informal um, way of living so these people need to go out of her houses or her place to uh, to, to, to find um, 
uh, something to eat sometimes, no? And also we we were looking for people that uh, have a family in the rural areas, and now they don't uh, they don't they can't go there because they don't have there is no transportation and they have to go walking to their cities, which is very very far away, and and this is. It's, it's very, very worrying. Uh, we are very worried about these people and also um, uh, this situation, I think it will struggle um, and it's maybe uh, if the government doesn't look for the people that right now are looking, they, they need to go out of her, of her house to look for work or out of her city to go back to the rural areas. To, to, because they wanted to be with their family. They, the government needs to look after these people uh, because otherwise, uh, you know, um, uh, there, there's going to be uh, a, 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 such a terrible time in our, our country for, for us, for everybody, you know? Natalia, I know that um, you've been interviewed um, for an American documentary series uh, about historic pandemics and, and their effect in the region. From, from your point of view, what impact does such a devastating event like the coronavirus have on, uh, on the political landscape? Is it something that could really uh, impact that landscape and we could maybe see a, a rise uh, back in, in some of those authoritarian times in Peru's history? Well, let's hope not. I think that the, the president of Peru, who is, has a lot of support from the population, upwards of 70%, even though the quarantine has been very strict, and as Ines says, not a many people can, can follow it. I, uh, Peru is also going to be supposed to have a presidential election next year, and it re remains to be seen how that will play out in the post-pandemic scenario. Vizcarra, the current sitting president, has said that he's not aiming to run for president, uh, but we still don't know who will. I mean, everything seems to be very much suspended. I mean, Peru will celebrate its bicentennial exactly the same day when a new president is going to be sworn in. However, I, looking at the, at the history, uh, they say that these kind of events put a mirror on societies and the society reflects back what, what they are. And, and we see it quite clearly in Latin America and with different perspectives because we can see presidents like the Peruvian one who's taken a lot of action compared to the ones in Brazil or Mexico that haven't. But also, we're not seeing the kind of violence and uh, difficulties that are now happening in the United States where the race issue is now really um, kind of overshadowing the, the terrible issue of the pandemic and the place where it's, it's, it's happening the worst. And Eduardo, because you have um, worked on the Truth Commissions and, and worked with human rights with so many countries, um, what, how, how do you think the impact of the current situation will play on, on Peru? Are you concerned that, that, again, there could be that slip into authoritarianism? Or as Natalia says, because Peru has been quite decisive uh, compared to other countries, that, you know, there's hope of continuing on that road to progress? Well, I think this kind of crisis um, can go in any direction. The net effect, I think, is that they radicalize the polarization that exists in the political arena. Um, you can either take the situation as an opportunity for big uh, structural change in a better direction, and hopefully in a more progressive and inclusive direction, to attack the root causes of the suffering that we're having now. Um, or you can uh, use another effect of this crisis, which is fear, to um, instill in the population feelings of, uh, of terror and uh, move the population to more radical and exclusionary practices. Uh, and that is, of course, something that we are going to see and that we are seeing in many societies right now. Hopefully, as Natalia mentioned, in Peru, um, there will be um, a, a constructive response to what we are seeing now, and uh, we will um, face the, the different challenges that this uh, uh, situation has brought to us. Um, something that I should mention is that um, while this crisis is taking place, there are truth commissions working 
right now in different countries in the world. There is a truth commission working on the legacy of the internal conflict in Colombia. There is another truth commission working in Mali on, on also the internal conflict of that country. There is a truth commission going on in Norway about the um, uh, policies of exclusion against the Sami indigenous population in that country. And uh, these are commissions that are working on historical memory issues under the conditions of COVID. Um, and that is, of course, a tremendous challenge. But what is uh, interesting and, and fascinating, and I think uh, uh, it fills you with hope, is that they are finding ways to do that. And they are using technology, of course, but they are also reframing their work um, in order to be able to reach uh, to the victims and in order to be able to reach to the public and to create connections between the kind of uh, work in memory that we do and the experiences that people have now. For example, um, for people that have suffered a quarantine, um, now it is a little bit easier to understand the experience of people who were deprived of liberty um, uh, for, for so many years. Um, now we are suffering a horrendous um, uh, disruption of grieving all over the world because it is impossible to properly grieve in these conditions. But I think now we understand what uh, the families of the disappeared all over Latin America experienced. So these are, for example, the kind of reflections that truth commissions are doing right now. I was chatting very recently with members of the Truth Commission of Colombia, and they had decided that they wanted to um, reflect on the current crisis from the standpoint of historical memory. And I think that is incredibly valuable incredibly valuable and really reassuring and, and quite inspiring to know that against the odds uh, people are still working to uh, to get those messages out um, we we're, uh, we're coming to the end of our um, our virtual panel now I just got a, a few more questions that have come in uh, from you on YouTube uh, and Facebook uh, Natalia one for you from Robin Granger um, what lessons does Peru have to teach the world of um, 2020 from its own experiences I think that Peru has uh, come to a reckoning and there has been citizen action for a long time. I and mean, let's remember that the human rights movement in Peru was very strong even during the years of violence. And then it managed to, to move forward and create, uh, support the creation of the Truth Commission during the transition after the fall of Fujimori. And now many years later, after t nearly 20 years of that, we have a museum of memory. We have a, a series of collections that are accessible. So Peru can teach the, the rest of the world how to continue fighting for the justice to come. It's not just about justice, it's also about information, it's about memory and history and uh, thinking about all those things. For instance, now we, we think of how this is impacting the world, it was possible to, to say, well, let's follow on Peru and let's not stop complaining about what we think is unfair, what we think uh, needs to be remembered, the people who have died. And I think that's the kind of example that Peru can set. It's a really important example, uh, and I think a perfect place to finish off uh, this special virtual screening and Q&A. Thank you uh, to Natalia, Inez and Eduardo for, for joining and answering your questions. And thank you to you at home for sending in uh, such fantastic questions uh, on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, we try to answer as many of them as we can. Um, and there's a chance to uh, find out some more about uh, the University of Kent's amazing research projects uh, next Thursday, the 11th of June when we'll, we, we'll be back for another Latin American story uh, with La Cristiada, a civil war, which follows Dr. Mark Lawrence, a history professor uh, who uncovers and uh, unpicks one of the most divisive chapters in Mexico's modern history. So all that to look forward to. Um, but in case you missed it at the top of the program, uh, we'll be playing Peru, a living memory for you again. Thank you all very much for joining this evening uh, or afternoon or wherever you are in the world. And uh, all the very best.
I believe that in the case of Peru, but everywhere as well, it is very important to know what has happened in the past so that you have a real assessment of the situation, the current things that are happening, always have an origin in what's come before. LUM is a space of memory national that basically helps us to reflect on the period of violence that lived the country in the 80s to 2000. Aquí se hacen actividades también pedagógicas, culturales, eh, también se promueve el tema de la investigación académica. Entonces, es por eso que incluso en el Ministerio de Cultura se hace esta diferenciación. No estamos ni siquiera propiamente en la, no, no estamos ni siquiera en la categoría de museo, sino es por eso que se ha creado especialmente para este espacio eh, la denominación del lugar. ¿no? El papel que ha jugado Natalia en el LUM ha sido muy importante, pues básicamente ayudó a la constitución de esta área del Centro de Documentación e Investigación, porque vieron que era importante que no solamente existiera la parte museográfica, sino de que ésta se complementara con fuentes, archivos, documentos, que dieron una fuente primaria no solamente a los investigadores, sino quién sabe estudiantes de colegios y otros actores este, que confluyen en este espacio acerca de la importancia ¿no? de LUM. El Centro de Documentación investigación es un espacio que forma parte del lugar la memoria atendemos dos problemas que hemos identificado como parte ya del ministerio de cultura en primer lugar la necesidad de poder centralizar todas las fuentes históricas que están vinculadas al estudio de lo que fue el proceso de violencia que vivió nuestro país durante la década de los 80 al 2000 esto lo hemos eh, la necesidad de poder preservar esta información importante a nivel nacional las hemos recogido, digitalizado y conservado para ponerla, y este es el segundo punto, eh, darle un acceso a todos los investigadores desde una plataforma virtual. Tenemos más de 100.000 archivos en línea, en diversos tipos de soporte. Tenemos desde canciones, música, video, audio, documentos de prensa, documentos clasificados en la CIA, historietas. En realidad una diversidad de fuentes históricas que eh, estén a la mano del investigador para poder establecer nuevos estudios en relación al proceso de violencia. Sí, en este caso es poder integrar la información de las colecciones que tenemos digitalizadas en la plataforma, porque es importante la difusión de cómo pueden utilizar los estudiantes y profesores los recursos que tenemos en línea. Como, como comprenderán, este es un espacio muy frágil, en realidad políticamente hablando, y se requiere no solamente, quién sabe, del apoyo económico que nos puedan brindar, sino de los aliados que podamos tener. Y, y en ese sentido, este, Natalia ha ayudado mucho a eso, ¿no? Es un aliado que tiene, al menos en el país se le respeta mucho, se conoce su trayectoria de historiadora que tiene en esta universidad. Entonces es por ello que creo que, de, que con aliados como estos, como Natalia, es que el espacio todavía continúa a pesar de todas las crisis que ha habido en el país. Son procesos largos y si es que no hay quien los esté impulsando, si es que no hay quien los esté moviendo, no pasa nada. O sea, esto no viene, no está en la agenda del poder, no está en la agenda de los gobiernos, no está en la agenda de los congresos. Eso está en la agenda de las personas a suceder y solo, solo sucede si hay cosas como esta cambiando el, con con muestras temporales, haciendo concursos, haciendo debates, con ensayos, llevando la información a, a más sitios. Eso es, o sea, creo que es... I think it's important for us to understand what happened uh, in order to construct, um, to build um, uh, a memory that uh, um, identify these, these persons, these women as victims, but also like um, very strong women that s still trying to find justice. Sintetiza la razón de ser de, de este evento. Vamos a recibir con un fuerte aplauso para conversar.
Salso, de la gesta independentista y el proceso de independencia. A Natalia Sobrevilla. Un fuerte aplauso para ella. Aquí también mi gesta. Se da la abolición de la Constitución de Cádiz del 12 y se va a dar un eh, nuevo momento de campaña militar. As Peru is going into the bicentenario, we come in 200 years of independence, and there is sort of, we are gearing into a reflection, you know, of what that meant, you know, and where we are, you know. And so that makes uh, the dialogue and uh, the investigations of people like Natalia on uh, our history is uh, more relevant. Por supuesto que sí, este, no solamente por la, primero, reconocer el trabajo de Natalia que, está, que realiza en el mundo, para el Perú es un orgullo muy enorme, para los historiadores es, es un modelo, es un ejemplo la labor que Natalia Sobrevilla está, está haciendo alrededor del mundo, eh, sus investigaciones tienen muchísima relevancia y, y sí es importante porque nos sirve de base, nos sirve de fundamento para trabajos de investigación que se hacen acá en el Perú para los historiadores de acá en Perú. I hope that I am able to continue contributing to this conversation about citizenship and about what it means to, uh, for elections, for Congress, for Parliament, what it means to have access to information, to have access to libraries and collections, and that that will result in a better practice of democracy. <laughs> Siempre retroceder un poquito en nuestra historia es para poder replantearnos qué es lo que queremos de nuestro país, no solamente como ciudadanos, sino también como gobernantes o los gobernantes, y poder recordar, retroceder en el tiempo, en nuestra historia, para no volver a cometer los mismos errores en nuestro presente y en un futuro. Es necesario que nosotros como peruanos podamos conocer nuestra historia, eh, aceptarnos en nuestra diversidad cultural y poder eh, unirnos como hermanos para poder reconstruir nuestra historia, fortalecerla y seguir trabajando rumbo a un nuevo país o un mejor país para todos y para todos, con oportunidades para todos, para cada uno de nuestros hermanos que viven en nuestro país. It's a moment uh, to reflect about, about our past, about our history, uh, what is the meaning of independence in our country, uh, in our region, because this has been a regional uh, process in all uh, South America. And it's like to stand for a moment and uh, to question ourselves where are we now. Para la, para la.